The Vicar of Wakefield by Oliver Goldsmith. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 8. An Amour Which Promises Little Good Fortune, Yet May Be Productive of Much. The next morning we were again visited by Mr. Birchill. Though I began, for certain reasons, to be displeased with the frequency of his return, but I could not refuse him my company and fireside. It is true his labour more than requited his entertainment, for he wrought among us with vigour, and either in the meadow or at the hayrick put himself foremost. Besides, he had always something amusing to say that lessened our toil, and was at once so out of the way and yet so sensible that I loved, laughed at, and pitied him. My only dislike arose from an attachment he discovered to my daughter. He would, in a jesting manner, call her his little mistress, and when he bought each of the girls a set of ribbons, hers was the finest. I knew not how, but he every day seemed to become more amiable, his wit to improve, and his simplicity to assume the superior airs of wisdom. Our family dined in the field, and we sat, or rather reclined, round a temperate repast, our cloth spread upon the hay, while Mr. Burchill gave cheerfulness to the feast. To heighten our satisfaction, two blackbirds answered each other from opposite hedges. The familiar redbreast came and pecked the crumbs from our hands, and every sound seemed but the echo of tranquillity. I never sit thus, said Sophia, but I think of the two lovers, so sweetly described by Mr. Gay, who were struck dead in each other's arms. There is something so pathetic in the description that I have read it an hundred times with new rapture. In my opinion, cried my son, the finest strokes in that description are much below those in the Asis and Galatea of Ovid. The Roman poet understands the use of contrast better, and upon that figure, artfully managed, all strength in the pathetic depends. It is remarkable, cried Mr. Burchill, that both the poets you mention have equally contributed to introduce a false taste into their respective countries by loading all their lines with epithet. Men of little genius found them most easily imitated in their defects, and English poetry, like that in the latter empire of Rome, is nothing at present but a combination of luxuriant images without plot or connection, a string of epithets that improve the sound without carrying on the sense. But perhaps, madam, while I thus reprehend others, you'll think it just that I should give them an opportunity to retaliate. And, indeed, I have made this remark only to have an opportunity of introducing to the company a ballad which, whatever be its other defects, is, I think, at least, free from those I have mentioned. A Ballad Turn, gentle hermit of the dale, and guide my lonely way to where yon taper cheers the vale with hospitable ray. For here, forlorn and lost, I tread with fainting steps and slow, where wilds immeasurably spread seem lengthening as I go. Forbear, my son, the hermit cries, to tempt the dangerous gloom, for yonder faithless phantom flies to lure thee to thy doom. Here to the houseless child of want my door is open still, and though my portion is but scant, I give it with good will. Then turn to-night and freely share whate'er my cell bestows, my rushy couch and frugal fare, my blessing and repose. No flocks that range the valley free, to slaughter I condemn. Taught by that power that pities me, I learn to pity them. But from the mountain's grassy side a guiltless feast I bring, a scrip with herbs and fruits supplied, and water from the spring. Then, pilgrim, turn thy cares for go, all earth-born cares are wrong. Man wants but little here below, nor wants that little long. Soft as the dew from heaven descends, his gentle accents fell. The modest stranger lowly bends and follows to the cell. Far in a wilderness obscure the lonely mansion lay, a refuge to the neighbouring poor and strangers led astray. No stores beneath its humble thatch required a master's care. The wicket opening with a latch received the harmless pair. And now when busy crowds retire to take their evening rest, the hermit trimmed his little fire and cheered his pensive guest. 
and spread his vegetable store, and gaily pressed and smiled, and skilled in legendary lore the lingering hours beguiled. Around in sympathetic mirth its tricks the kitten tries, the cricket chirrups in the hearth, the crackling faggot flies. But nothing could a charm impart to soothe the stranger's woe, for grief was heavy as his heart, and tears began to flow. His rising cares the hermit spied, with answering care oppressed, and whence, unhappy youth, he cried, the sorrows of thy breast. From better habitations spurn, reluctant dost thou rove, or grieve for friendships unreturned, or unregarded love. Alas, the joys that fortune brings are trifling and decay, and those who prize the paltry things more trifling still than they. And what is friendship but a name, a charm that lulls to sleep, a shade that follows wealth or fame, but leaves the wretch to weep? And love is still an emptier sound, the modern fair one's jest, on earth unseen, or only found to warm the turtle's nest. For shame, fond youth, thy sorrows hush, and spurn the sex, he said, but while he spoke a rising blush his lovelorn guest betrayed. Surprised, he sees new beauties rise, swift mantling to the view, like colours o'er the morning skies, as bright, as transient too. The bashful look, the rising breast, alternate spread alarms, the lovely stranger stands confessed a maid in all her charms. And, ah, forgive a stranger rude, a wretch forlorn, she cried, whose feet unhallowed thus intrude where heaven and you reside. But let a maid thy pity share, whom love has taught to stray, who seeks for rest but finds despair companion of her way. My father lived beside the Tyne, a wealthy lord was he, and all his wealth was marked as mine, he had but only me. To win me from his tender arms unnumbered suitors came, who praised me for imputed charms, and felt or feigned a flame. Each hour a mercenary crowd with richest proffers strove, among the rest young Edwin bowed, but never talked of love. In humble simplest habit clad no wealth nor power had he, wisdom and worth were all he had, but these were all to me. The blossom opening to the day, the dews of heaven refined, could naught of purity display to emulate his mind. The dew, the blossom on the tree, with charms in constant shine. Their charms were his, but woe to me, their constancy was mine. For still I tried each fickle art, importunate and vain, and while his passion touched my heart, I triumphed in his pain. Till, quite dejected with my scorn, he left me to my pride, and sought a solitude forlorn in secret where he died. But mine the sorrow, mine the fault, and well my life shall pay. I'll seek the solitude he sought, and stretch me where he lay. And there forlorn, despairing, hid, I'll lay me down and die. T'was so for me that Edwin did, and so for him will I. Forbid it, heaven, the hermit cried, and clasped her to his breast. The wandering fair one turned to chide, "'Twas Edwin's self that pressed. "'Turn, Angelina, ever dear, my charmer, turn to see. "'Thy own, thy long-lost Edwin, here, restored to love and thee. "'Thus let me hold thee to my heart, and every care resign. "'And shall we never, never part my life, my all that's mine? "'No, never from this hour to part will live and love so true. "'The sigh that tends thy constant heart shall break thy Edwin's too.' While this ballad was reading, Sophia seemed to mix an air of tenderness with her approbation, but our tranquillity was soon disturbed by the report of a gun just by us, and immediately after a man was seen bursting through the hedge to take up the game he had killed. This sportsman was the squire's chaplain, who had shot one of the blackbirds that so agreeably entertained us. So loud a report and so near startled my daughters and I could perceive that Sophia, in the fright, had thrown herself into Mr. Burchill's arms for protection. The gentleman came up and asked pardon for having disturbed us, affirming that he was ignorant of our being so near. He therefore sat down by my youngest daughter, and, sportsmanlike, offered her what he had killed that morning. She was going to refuse, but a private look from her mother soon induced her to correct the mistake, 
and accept his present, though with some reluctance. My wife, as usual, discovered her pride in a whisper, observing that Sophie had made a conquest of the chaplain, as well as her sister had of the squire. I suspected, however, with more probability, that her affections were placed upon a different object. The chaplain's errand was to inform us that Mr. Thornhill had provided music and refreshments, and intended that night giving the young ladies a ball by moonlight on the grass plot before our door. Nor can I deny, continued he, but I have an interest in being first to deliver this message, as I expect for my reward to be honoured with Miss Sophie's hand as a partner. To this my girl replied that she should have no objection if she could do it with honour. But here, continued she, is a gentleman, looking at Mr. Burchill, who has been my companion in the task of the day, and it is fit he should share in its amusements. Mr. Burchill returned her a compliment for her intentions, but resigned her up to the chaplain, adding that he was to go that night five miles, being invited to an harvest supper. His refusal appeared to me a little extraordinary, nor could I conceive how so sensible a girl as my youngest could thus prefer a man of broken fortunes to one whose expectations were much greater. But as men are most capable of distinguishing merit in women, so the ladies often form the truest judgments of us. The two sexes seemed placed as spies upon each other, and are furnished with different abilities adapted for mutual inspection. End of chapter